Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Yam and I'm an undergraduate assistant from the Center for Multilingual and Intercultural Communication. After an amazing lecture and discussion with Dr. Andrea Scarino, the MIC team is excited to give everyone an opportunity to learn more about her. Let's give a warm welcome to our guests. Introducing our interviewer, Dr. Ji Wan Huang. She is a lecturer in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at Stony Brook University, where she teaches all levels of Korean language courses and Korean linguistics courses. Her research interests lie in phonetics, phonology, and psycholinguistics, drawing data mainly from second language learners. The main goal of her research is to investigate characteristics of L2 speech to understand the mechanisms underlying L2 production and perception, and to examine sociocultural and cognitive factors associated with L2 learning. And introducing our interviewee, Dr. Andrea Scarino is an associate professor in applied linguistics and director of the Research Center for Languages and Cultures in Justice and Society at the University of South Australia. Her research expertise is in languages, education, linguistically and culturally diverse societies, second language learning within an intercultural orientation, second language assessment, and second language teacher education. She has been a chief investigator on a range of externally funded research grants. She has worked in diverse contexts beyond Australia, including Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, France, and New Zealand. Books include Intercultural Language Teaching and Learning and Dynamic Ecologies, a relational perspective on language education in the Asia Pacific region. She is currently the chair of the Multicultural Education and Languages Committee, a committee that advises the Minister for Education on Languages and Multicultural Education in South Australia. I will now be passing the mic to Dr. Ji Wan Huang. Enjoy. Could you tell us a little bit about how you first became interested in doing research in intercultural? communication assessment and interculturality in general? Okay, well, um, it came from my own work in languages education, both as a teacher um, and as a researcher, uh, and um, recognizing the insufficiency of a structuralist view. Uh, I could see the limits. We made claims uh, that we promoted intercultural relations and understanding and so on. But uh, at the same time, uh, we um, actually continue to just teach the language. Uh, and so um, the um, structuralist views did not capture for me uh, the effort and the nuance that was involved uh, in the exchange of meanings. Um, and I could see that uh, these views did not actually um, give a sense of the power uh, of language, that they didn't fully capture the process of um, exchange uh, in linguistic and cultural diversity that they did not really engage the learners and their identities. Um, it was all about the language. This is the language. This is the linguistic uh, system. Um, but it didn't ask the learners, who can you be in the language that you are learning? How do you move between your Englishness, for us, most of them are English speakers, your Englishness and the language that um, I was teaching, uh, which were, was French. So then uh, it was also strengthened by a lot of work on the internationalization of education. Um, I was asked by our vice chancellor, the president of our university, to do a, an investigation into the internationalization of the curriculum, not the internationalization of the university, but she was very much a, a president who was ahead of her time, the internationalization of the curriculum. In other words, how into, you know, what was going on in, in the teaching and learning uh, in the university. That was in 1995. Uh, and that led me to think about creating knowledge um, uh, and understanding knowledge as cultural. Uh, and also uh, the different perspectives on knowledge. Uh, and um, it opened my mind to um, applying knowledge 
in different contexts and communicating knowledge um, in a global landscape. And all of these were dimensions of knowing. And of course, language um, is also one of those. And so it gave me a very strong perspective on uh, knowing within um, a global perspective. And why did I select assessment? Because I recognized that this was the real gap. Nobody was looking at um, assessment. Um, people were interested in an intercultural orientation, um, but the conceptual foundations were not sufficiently strong to allow for operationalizing the, um, the uh, conception into curriculum and assessment um, processes. People just did not know how to do it. And I've always been interested in alternative um, assessment and I've been aware for a long time of the limits and also the potential injustices um, of the traditional assessment paradigm. So I began the experimentation with teachers uh, of languages so that together we could consider exactly uh, what is this intercultural capability uh, and how is it evidenced particularly in the learning of languages. So now yes. going back to the, uh, uh, the work that you did with, with yes. the teachers, uh, I was curious about what was the most uh, rewarding part of this work for you? Well, um, I think that uh, collaboration uh, with teachers is um, absolutely uh, essential. In that first study that we did, the Australian Research Council funded one on assessing intercultural capability, Tony Lidicote and I were the principal CIs and Michelle Kohler was uh, also working with us. She was our PhD student uh, at the time um, and has become uh, a very much uh, a valued colleague as part of the team. Um, and um, our questions were genuine. Mm -hmm. And I think the teachers appreciate real questions that, mm -hmm. you know, there is a genuineness uh, about them. And our question was, was well, what is this um, intercultural capability and how do we elicit it? Uh, and what does evidence of it look like in education? And these were exactly the questions that came from uh, the teachers. And so we uh, had been working on the orientation and we understood that interculturality was an orientation, not a methodology. It's a way of seeing the whole act of teaching and learning languages. It's not about an approach. There are pedagogical implications, but it's a change in your whole headset about language learning. And we knew that um, uh, there were teachers who were doing really good work. So they would have had a tacit view of what that was like. And we knew that if we harvested the tacit views of good teachers who were willing to experiment, uh, we would be able uh, to work with them. Um, but it was a very different way of understanding uh, language and uh, learning. And um, it did uh, present uh, challenges for them. The mm -hmm. initial stages obviously involved drafting a unit from their own program. So it was real. It what, was what they were doing next in their own program. So it wasn't mm -hmm. an extra or an artificial. It was not a hypothetical. And we asked them to provide a rationale for all of the choices that they made. Mm -hmm. Why this text? Why this? And we don't call them tasks. We, learn, we talk about learning experiences. Mm -hmm. What is the student going to experience? Not what only what is the student going to do? Because what they're going to do, they're going to write an essay. What's the experience that they're actually going to live? So we asked the teachers, and we were quite demanding, because we asked them not only to design this unit, but also to provide a rationale, in other words, a running commentary along the side. Um, and so we provided detailed feedback. So it's, we were evolving a way of working with them. So it was challenging because they didn't know, mm -hmm. and we didn't know, and they wanted answers from us. 
but the answers were in the praxis. It's linking their knowledge to our knowledge and trying to work through the puzzles uh, that that um, presented. And we provided detailed individualized uh, feedback so that our understandings were actually meshed. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had group debriefings, facilitated dialogues, as we now call them. And that was where I pushed and probed their understandings. Um, and they were invited to each present their unit to the whole group. We recorded all of this with me pushing and probing. But what do you really mean? But you've said this. But we, and that kind of... Now, frustrating at times. Frustrating mm -hmm. for me trying to get something more frustrating for them to say, well, what does she want from me? <laughs> uh, you know, it is, and, and it is delicate work. Um, and all of this was recorded and transcribed. And then each teacher enacted the plan mm -hmm. and came back. And again, we had group debriefings and, uh, and so on. And then the cycle involved individual, through the um, enactment, they gathered a lot of data, but it was not just students' work at the end. And this is where we learned that it's not just products, right. it's also process. Process. And so it's so easy to put on a, um, a mobile phone to record a, a, a discussion. And in that discussion, we can see what's going on. Who's asking what question? What, you know, what's really uh, happening here? And then uh, we did more and more uh, debriefing and, and the teachers expressed all of their challenges. That's why we came to know them uh, so well. And there were many. Um, but this way of working enabled us to go um, more and more deeply. I'm sure Tony, my colleague, found this somewhat frustrating mm -hmm. as a researcher. Mm -hmm. He thought it was taking us too long and that perhaps we should be getting more mm -hmm. from our teachers. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Jiwon, I can tell you, uh, and, and he actually said, this is the worst project I've ever worked on. <laughs> I, don't, I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, but he did. And I was frustrated too, because I said, well, no, you know, it's not. It is as it is, and we've got to understand this in its reality. And we can only understand it in its reality from the teachers we're working with. And so... We kept uh, going, but afterwards we had the opportunity of looking at the different cases. The diff each unit and each teacher was a case in this collective case study. Mm -hmm. And as we looked at these case studies collectively, we actually began to see that we really did have something which we had not quite noticed while we were, were doing it. So lots of um, challenges, but I'm, I'm pleased with uh, having evolved a way of working with teachers that really embodies the principles um, of praxis. Um, theory meeting, practice, practice meeting theory, fabulous. Right. So now I'm curious about um, whether you are still in contact with some of the teachers who were who you were absolutely. With? Oh, okay. yes. With yes, uh, and it has continued because, of course, this was, and I've only explained one project. Mm -hmm. Every year we mm -hmm. have continued working in different ways with different groups of teachers. So mm -hmm. our work continues. That was very intensive because it was a three-year study. Most of the subsequent work has been a one-year study. Mm -hmm. We're hoping for the next grant mm -hmm. uh, that it will be another two or three-year study where we can have more than one cycle mm -hmm. of uh, development. I and see. we're going to look at judging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, right. Very so now, challenging. Right, very challenging. Now, considering my own situatedness in the U.S. public college where mm -hmm. I have sometimes 30 students in one mm -hmm. elementary Korean class, which makes assessment of language learning within this intercultural orientation very, very challenging. How do I operationalize this in our own settings? Do you have an idea for this? 
Well, uh, well, the teachers that um, uh, we've been working with all have classes of uh, 30. They, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah. So, um, you know, and there are the practicalities, mm -hmm. but um, we also have the technological means. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the technological means are very helpful uh, to us in terms of the data gathering. Um, mm -hmm. And I say data gathering because it is um, trying to capture the evidence. So if you are um, assessing a class or group discussion, put on the record, press record on mm -hmm. your mobile phone, um, and, you know, it may not be 100% uh, quality, but, you know, work with that, get the best means available, uh, and you will see who says what in um, a particular discussion. Uh, if it is uh, reflect, you can institute a reflective journal, and um, students can record their reflections in an ongoing reflective journal. We've had uh, teachers... Uh, doing that over the, the period of a year. Mm -hmm. But rather than just leaving it to the student, the teacher provides prov further provocations along the way. Mm -hmm. And then over the, it's, it becomes like a portfolio um, that, uh, you know, it's a journal that, that you see. So we need different means. It's not sort of, you know, examination style right. or test style mm -hmm. work. Now, you may, you may want to, you know, test vocabulary or whatever. Well, the best way of testing vocabulary is to give a vocabulary test. Mm -hmm. It's logical. Um, but then you've got to realise that in your overall assessment scheme, what you have assessed is vocabulary. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you have to give that assessment a weighting within the larger picture of assessment. So you have to play with the assessment scheme as a whole for your course. What are the elements of it? Um, and what weighting do we give if learning vocabulary is a means towards communicating and engaging? Well, then it, it's there because you want the students to do it but it has a reduced place. I know some um, primary and secondary school teachers who spend a whole lesson, 40 minutes, just on a vocabulary test. Mm. How can that be? Mm -hmm. How useful is that? You do a vocabulary check, 10 mm -hmm. minutes, it's done. Right. So I'm not saying you don't uh, you know, you remove uh, vocabulary, let us say, as, as an emblem of that kind of, of testing, um, because you do want to know that they are uh, learning the language itself, but it has crowded our assessment schemes for too long, and yet we have made the claim, we claim that language learning opens students' eyes to the world. Well, not if we're teaching vocabulary, you know, if we're just assessing vocabulary, it's not, it's opening their eyes to vocabulary. It's not opening their eyes to the world. So we can't claim that we're doing this and then act differently. And if it is only uh, vocabulary tests, the question that we've got to ask ourselves is what image um, of language learning as students forming in their minds. Mm. They're forming in their minds a view that language is just about words. Right. Well, is or that study. Image? Right. Or, or yeah. learning up, learning these grammatical rules. Right. Why? Because we as, as teachers justify the grammatical rules because we want to give them the keys to the system. Sure, but... What are we telling? Uh, what's the message that students are receiving? Mm -hmm. um, they're not receiving a message about the power of language and what right. language does and how language and culture operate in diversity. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of diversity, we, we have been concerned with how to teach language more effectively, but not so yes. much with who is learning. But 
at Stony Brook University, for example, we are witnessing this, this changing demographics in our language classrooms becoming mm -hmm. more and more diverse in many dimensions. So for instance, you know, I tell people that I meet for the first time that I teach Korean at a college and they imagine me teaching Korean to these monolingual English speakers yes. learning Korean. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But we have a wide range of diversity and many bilingual and multilingual speakers in our language classrooms. What would this change in student population mean for curriculum development and assessment? Well, look, there is absolutely no doubt everywhere in the world that our classes are increasingly diverse and more complex, complex diversity. Uh, and teaching and learning uh, languages <clears throat> cannot just be, as we've been saying, a matter of conveying the structural system and then applying it in uh, communication in different contexts. And we say communication, um, but oftentimes it's pseudo communication of the kind, shall we have a cup of coffee? Yes, let's go to the cafe together. Um, the paper that I wrote with um, Constant Leung uh, on goals of language learning um, for the centenary issue of the MLJ outlines um, a critique of this communicative um, orientation that we've had uh, for a long time. Language is not a neutral uh, resource out there ready to convey uh, meanings. Uh, rather, what our language teaching and learning is about people's meaning making uh, and identity formation. We cannot begin if we see language learning as belonging to our students, as being about how people exchange, well, how people interpret, create and exchange meanings, then um, it cannot be, um, uh, we cannot ignore the students themselves. They are part of the story. If you know that in your class, you've got a Japanese student, we say, you know, you are teaching Korean, but we say now, how does this actually work in Japanese? You know, and we bring in uh, the knowledge, whatever we know of the students, and this is why we need to know them so well, and all of our work begins with profiling the learners mm -hmm. so that the teachers know who is there. And you don't just do it once. It's a kind of an ongoing thing. But we as teachers have the privilege of having those students for a whole semester. We do see them. Um, and so if, um, if the learning uh, is going to be of this uh, interculturally oriented um, way, then uh, it has to be meaningful to them. And this is my own sense of relevance. We have to know the students. And yes, we've always known that we have to make teaching and learning of languages relevant. But my preferred idea here is that it's actually got to be meaningful and we've got to um, realise that language learning is highly personal mm -hmm. and subjective. There are particular reasons why I might want to learn Korean. Um, but my reasons might be quite different from someone else's reasons. And so... Um, for these kinds of reasons, we've got to begin any kind of intercultural orientation uh, with the learners themselves. Mm -hmm. It's not just their background. And this is my point. They're, who they are needs to be foregrounded. In the, and the moment that we call it, oh, the learner background, yes, I've got uh, six Japanese background students, I've got uh, 10 Chinese, I've got, um, uh, you know, 20 US born, whatever. You can see, A, the generalizing as we try to profile, and you can see that we are um, actually, um, by calling it background, 
we tend to leave it in the background. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that our knowledge of our students actually needs to come to the foreground and we have to use it in really creative ways. Because if I know that there are different opinions in the class, mm -hmm. I will know who to ask so that we then get that diversity of perspective in our discussions in the class. Um, and that we draw on their knowledge in um, interesting ways. And so because intercultural work uh, is not just about subject matter, uh, it's not the topic uh, itself. In fact, um, you know, the topic doesn't actually help us much. It is uh, about knowing and understanding the learners. It's their intracultural self along with the intercultural self that we're trying to develop. And the journey will be different for each of the students. Now you will say, gosh, it's challenging. This is one class and there are 30 and I've got, I don't know how many classes you have. We come closer um, and closer and um, we learn ourselves to be better and better mediators. Um, and so we profile the learners in an ongoing way. Uh, we use the diversity within the class in uh, creative ways. Um, and so uh, participating in joint reflection in the classroom becomes a part of the dynamics of class exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's what we do here. We have these really interesting discussions where we work with language and then we unpack language. Wow. Um, and uh, the curriculum does need to be redesigned. Mm -hmm. There are implications for uh, redesigning the curriculum. I had the privilege of redesigning the Australian, the official Australian curriculum for South Australian school, uh, for mm -hmm. Australian schools. It's mm -hmm. the national curriculum mm -hmm. for Australia. I designed it within an intercultural orientation. So if you want to go and have a look at what I put inside it as part of the design, um, it's uh, by the um, uh, ACARA, A-C-A-R-A. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, that's the National Curriculum for Languages for Australia. Uh, was my design to try and uh, put these ideas into mm -hmm. uh, the curriculum. The assessment, needs to be redesigned and it will need to be as far as you can go uh, in a non-traditional paradigm. Your institution will have requirements, but you push as far as you can go. 